Jean-Claude. Thank you very much, Laurent, for the kind introduction. Thanks. So, uh, as Laurent said, the, 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 this is the title of uh, my presentation, Beyond the Statistical Perspective of, on Deep Learning, which is in fact the usual one uh, nowadays, the topposic point of view, invariance and semantic information. So I just wanted to, 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 to notice that uh, there is an archive paper that uh, is a common work with Daniel Benkin, that uh, has been, uh, I mean, which is available since uh, last night uh, in archive. So, yeah. So it is uh, effectively a joint work with uh, Daniel Benkin. And uh, I would like also uh, to thank uh, a lot uh, 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 Laurent Lefort first, uh, who uh, uh, opened to me this uh, fantastic world of uh, Toposis in 2017. And also Olivia Carmelo, who has uh, helped us a lot uh, to, to, to understand uh, some notions that I will introduce uh, afterwards. So just a, a brief introduction on AI and machine learning uh, for our mathematician uh, colleagues. Um, I need, I need to say that I'm not at the origin a mathematician, but I'm coming from the electrical engineering world. So it's in general quite far away of uh, those uh, uh, things on toposis. And uh, this is through, uh, in fact, it is through AI, so artificial intelligence and machine learning that um, uh, I have been uh, confronted to, to toposis and uh, other mathematical notions. Uh, other related mathematical notions. So what, what is uh, machine learning? Uh, in fact, uh, very briefly, it can be, uh, uh, let's say, uh, it can be divided, subdivided into three uh, basic uh, tasks. Uh, the first one is called the supervised learning, which in general is uh, uh, used uh, to perform a classification or regression and uh, that means, for example, that uh, you, you, you want to recognize, uh, for example, in an image, if there is a cat or not. So just uh, use uh, what are called labeled input data. That means it's uh, images where someone has uh, labeled them with cats or non-cats. And so this is uh, used for the machine to be trained. Then, so you train uh, the model uh, by using these uh, labeled input data. And finally, you test it with new images and uh, you hope that you will be able to recognize even in new images that haven't been part of uh, uh, training data that you, you can recognize a cat or not. Regression is, let's say, uh, uh, related to more continuous uh, problems. Then there is also unsupervised learning. So you don't have any label data. You have a uh, basic uh, raw data. And the idea is uh, to perform grouping of, uh, it can be grouping, it can be dimension reduction or discrimination. So you don't know that uh, what you are considering is a cat because uh, in fact, this word is completely unknown to you. And what you want to do is to discriminate, for example, uh, cats and non-cats based on uh, some, uh, let's say, for example, cats will be in some uh, many folds and non-cats will be outside this many fold and you, you want to understand patterns and to discover the outputs. And then there is another one, which is uh, maybe uh, very close to the way uh, animals or humans are behaving, which is reinforcement learning where you have an agent that interacts with its environment by performing actions and learning from errors and rewards. So it's a trial and errors method. So it's in some sense, reinforcement learning, it can be considered as a kind of supervised learning since uh, when, when you have uh, uh, rewards or errors, in fact, there is someone, something that says that, I mean, that it is an error or that gives you some reward. And so that's why it's quite close to supervised learning. In this presentation, we will essentially consider the supervised learning case because maybe it's uh, the simplest one to understand in terms of topos, but uh, also the other ones can be understood this way. 
Okay, so in order to perform these uh, tasks of machine learning, in fact, the most popular way of doing that and most successful is using neural networks. So what is a, a neural network? So uh, this is uh, an example of uh, what is called fully connected deep neural network, where you have in fact uh, here, uh, so this is the simplest case, where you have input data here at uh, the input, so of this uh, neural network, and you have layers basically. So input layer, a first hidden layer, a second hidden layer, etc. And at the output, you have what is called output layer. So uh, I'm sorry, it's a little bit small, but the output of a neuron YJ will be, in fact, uh, a kind of uh, you, you perform, you compute uh, a linear combination of the inputs XI by using what are called weights W. IJ, and these weights will be, in fact, learned using training data, plus what is called a bias. So, so in fact, instead of being linear, it's affine, uh, an affine transformation. And then you apply uh, to this um, uh, number, you apply a nonlinear function phi, which is called an activation function. And that could be a sigmoid, so this one, a hyperbolic tangent, a rectified linear unit, so which is the, the third possibility and some other more uh, exotic uh, activation functions. So in fact, depending on the problem, you choose the one that is best suited. So in order to train neural network, that means in order to uh, compute the weights and the biases, in fact, you need uh, to, in fact, what is the, the most popular algorithm is, is called backpropagation. It, uh, uh, it dates from the 90s. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, what you're doing is that you compute uh, a loss function, which can be based uh, either on the kullback liberal cross entropy or mutual information, or maybe also some other, so, 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 some other uh, loss functions are also possible. Even some of them are just based on uh, uh, Euclidean distance. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, this uh, loss function has, uh, variables, which will be the weights and the biases of the neural network. And then you find them, the idea is to find the minimum of such function by using uh, the, the, the label data. So the label, the training data. And the idea is to use gradient descent and thanks to the chain rule in order to compute the partial derivatives, then the gradient calculus becomes very efficient and can be done layer by layer. And so this is uh, on this figure, so you can see, uh, uh, let's say, a schematic view of uh, backpropagation. So I don't want to spend too much time on that. So you have seen uh, a neural network based on fully connected uh, uh, layers, but you can have other architectures when you try uh, to deal with uh, uh, problems which are very specific. For example, uh, what are called the convolutional neural networks, I will come back to this architecture later on, because it's uh, something which is really related to, to uh, a word on my uh, title, invariance. So, and uh, the idea, in fact, is instead of considering a, a, a fully, uh, let's say, uh, let's say, a fully family of linear transformations um, on uh, when you are considering edges from one layer to another one, then uh, the idea is to restrain this uh, to some more specific linear transformation. And in this case, it will be convolutions. And so you will have uh, some layers which are convolutions followed by max pooling, which is just a kind of, uh, let's say, restriction. And then at the end, uh, you will have uh, fully connected layers. I will explain later uh, the, uh, why we use this architecture. This one, the convolutional neural networks are basically used in fact for computer vision tasks, so for image processing essentially. Then you have recurrent neural networks, you know, where in fact uh, here what you have are vectors and the idea is to use a kind of uh, let's say uh, uh, a kind of loop. If you, uh, if you unfold this loop, then you obtain this kind of architecture. 
So, in fact, this architecture can be used when you have a time series or when you have to consider, for example, a, a natural language processing where you have some sentences which can be considered as a, a kind of, 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 of time series, finally. And, uh, but uh, basic recurrent neural networks are not good. Uh, they cannot be trained efficiently. Because when you consider uh, um, a gradient descent, then the gradients rapidly vanishes. And so uh, that means that uh, the, the, the loss function uh, will not uh, um, uh, become uh, uh, very low. And uh, that means that you will have too many errors. So the idea is uh, to consider some other kinds of uh, cells in this uh, recurrent neural network uh, settings which are called the uh, long short term memory cells, LSTM cells. And uh, so uh, I will not spend too much time here as well. So as you can see, the idea is to have not only uh, short term uh, uh, memories, but also long term memories uh, in order to make uh, uh, these, uh, the, the, the neural network uh, uh, able to, to be trained, sorry, um, more efficiently. Okay, so after this uh, very brief introduction on uh, um, machine learning and neural networks, let's uh, go into uh, a topos' view of deep neural network. So uh, very briefly, what we have uh, is that in fact, it's possible first to model a neural network, uh, let's say, uh, by using, uh, uh, the, let's say, the, 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 these uh, those uh, Grothendieck th toposes, Let, it can be done uh, in several steps. The first one is based on the architecture of the DNN of the deep neural network, and it will constitute uh, the base site, the base Grothendieck site. So, in fact, uh, our way of considering it is by uh, considering. Uh, for example, in the case of a chain, for example, what you have seen was uh, these, this uh, uh, um, uh, fully connected uh, deep neural network. And in fact, uh, we have shown that the best way of uh, uh, modeling it using uh, uh, toposes was by considering that each layer is an object of some site. So here, in fact, uh, the feed-forward functioning of the network, when the network has been trained, uh, will in fact uh, correspond to a covariant functor X. So from the category, which is uh, generated by the graph, by this graph, to the category sets. So, I mean, uh, you can see that it smells uh, uh, the Grothendieck Grot topos, of course. In fact, uh, this uh, x k plus one k w, uh, which is in fact a mapping from x k to x k plus one, so it is a uh, maybe it, it will be an edge here, will correspond to the learned weights that goes from layer k plus one to layer k, and it will correspond to each row in uh, this category C up so of gamma. So gamma will be, uh, of course, uh, this uh, graph of, uh, of the neural network. And then the weights will be encoded in a covariant functor, so this uh, uh, blackboard W, from uh, the category C op of gamma to the category of sets. So the idea is that at each layer LK, so we define WK as the product of all the sets, in fact, W, so this is essentially uh, uh, a matrix uh, that goes from the layer L plus one to the layer L of weights, and to the edge that goes from layer LK to layer LK plus one, we will associate uh, the natural forgetting proje projection that goes from WK to WK plus one, okay? So then the Cartesian product xk times wk together with this map will also define the covariance functor uh, blackboard x. 
And uh, the natural projection from X to W will be in fact a natural transformation of functors. And what is interesting is that if you consider supervised learning, which is uh, the, the central case we will consider here, then the back propagation algorithm can be represented by a flow of natural transformations of the functor W to itself. And uh, in this case, in the category C of gamma, X, W, W, and X become contravariant functors from this category to sets. That means that they are pre-sheaves of a C, and that means that they will be the objects, objects in the uh, pre-sheaves topos uh, C at. Okay, so this is the case of a chain, which is quite simple, because in fact, uh, in all these settings, we will have objects and the natural transformations in the topos of pre-sheaves uh, based uh, on this uh, simple site. Now, if you have something a little bit different from a chain, that means if we consider the general case, then uh, the situation becomes a little bit more tricky. And uh, now the functioning and the weights uh, cannot be defined by functors on C of gamma. So in fact, what we have done is a canonical modification of this category. And now, for example, if you have uh, this kind of problem to be solved, that means you have uh, in this graph uh, many uh, different, uh, uh, let's say, modules that uh, converge to uh, this object A, a small A, uh, then uh, we have to perform a surgery because uh, considering uh, this as a site will not work at all. And the idea is to introduce new objects here, you can see, uh, between uh, all these A prime, A second, etc., and A, and the object A, here by introducing capital A star and capital A, right? And with arrows that go from A star to A and from small A to capital A. And that form a fork with tips in A prime, A second, et cetera. And the handle will be uh, formed by a capital A star, capital A and small A. And uh, what is it? And by, if we reverse the rows, then we will have a new oriented graph without oriented cycles and the new category C will replace that which, uh, sorry, the category which will replace C of gamma will be the category now C of uh, uh, bold gamma, which will be opposite to the category freely generated by this bold gamma. And now the main structural part, so that means the projection from a product uh, so the product of A prime, A second, et cetera, to its component can be now interpreted by the fact that the pre this pre-sheaf becomes a sheaf for natural Grothendieck topology J. And uh, in fact, uh, on every object X of this new category, uh, the only covering will be the full uh, slice category uh, C on X, except if X is of the type, type, sorry, A star, where in this case, we add the covering made by the rows uh, of the type A prime uh, uh, towards A star or A second et cetera, towards A star, et cetera. Okay? Yeah, so in this case, we have, uh, in fact, basically all possible scenarios that happened, uh, all possible structural scenario that happened in uh, 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 neural networks. So even if we consider modular neural networks uh, where you connect uh, many neural networks to some other ones, etc. Okay, so this is a st structure, but the structure is not enough. Now we have to consider a second uh, stage, which is now the uh, what we call a pre-semantics. And uh, in this case, we'll see that considering just uh, Grothendieck topos, uh, will not be enough uh, to uh, characterize all possible uh, neural networks that uh, uh, can be used now and maybe to consider to, to characterize also some new ones that may, may uh, uh, emerge uh, in, in the future. Okay, let's start uh, with a simple example, which is the example of convolutional neural networks. So this is the one that uh, I showed you uh, uh, in uh, a preceding slide. 
So here, you know, the images that, because this convolution neural network is used for image processing. And so images, of course, are assumed to be by nature invariant by planar translation. For example, if you have an object in an image and if you shift it, of course, uh, this object will still be the same object. And so the idea is to use this invariance uh, in order to learn much more efficiently. That means that uh, you will have, uh, much, if you are able to consider this invariant, this translational invariance, then you will be able to consider much, much uh, less weight to be learned. And that means also that you will need much less uh, um, uh, uh, training data, you know, in, in order to, to make uh, the, the, the neural network learn. So, in this case, in fact, uh, this is imposed this uh, in, to a large number of layers to accept now a non-trivial action of the group G of 2D translations, and also to a large number of connections between two layers to be compatible with the actions of uh, 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 this group. So that means that the, even the underlying linear part when it exists will be made by convolutions uh, with a numerical function on the plane. So this is the way, in fact, uh, this uh, action of uh, the group G of uh, 2D translations will be uh, considered. Of course, the, it doesn't forbid that in several layers, for example, these last ones, uh, the action of G is trivial in order to get invariant characteristics under translations. So in this case, of course, the layers can be fully connected. So motherly groups have been, con have been considered also in the uh, literature uh, uh, together with their uh, convolutions. So, and uh, now DNS that analyze images, uh, they have a always they are constructed in the same way, which is several channels of convolutional maps and with max pooling in order to, 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 to make this uh, as an object. And uh, all these are joined then with this uh, uh, fully connected uh, DNN in order to take a decision. In fact, uh, this looks as a, uh, you know, a stru structure in order to localize the translational invariance. And uh, this is uh, in fact what happens uh, in the visual areas in the animal brains. So it's really a copy of uh, the nature. So what is interesting also is that uh, experiments show here that in the first layers, we can see kinds of wavelet kernels that are formed spontaneously in order to translate contrast and color. And the uh, opposition kernels are formed to construct also the color environments. So, it's these convolutional neural networks are very, very uh, uh, interesting tool for, for image processing. Okay, so let's go back to our topostic interpretation now. So as we have seen, uh, we, we, we need to take into account uh, this uh, group invariance. So topostic manner to encode this situation, in fact, uh, consists in, uh, uh, in considering the contravariant functors from the category C of the network, so the one we have seen, that takes into account the uh, structure of the network, with values in the topos of G sets, okay? So, uh, because it's, uh, in fact, of course, uh, it is exactly, the, 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 in fact, the, 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 the actions of, of this group G on sets are, in, in, in fact, uh, the, the objects on, uh, in the topos of, of G sets. So the collections, these factors uh, with their morphisms, they will form a, a category which was shown to be itself a topos by Giraud in 1972. So we thank uh, Olivia to, 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 to have informed us of this fantastic work from, uh, from Giraud. And it is equivalent in fact uh, to introduce a category F which is fibered in groups isomorphic to G over the category C, okay? And it's, uh, it satisfied the axioms of, of a stack. So 
F, in this case, has a canonical topology J, which is the coarsest one, such that pi, uh, the morphism from F to C is continuous. And uh, in fact, uh, the ordinary topos E of sheaves of sets over this site, FJ, is named the classifying topos of the stack and is naturally equivalent to the uh, to, uh, uh, CJ uh, tilde that we have seen here. But the Giraud theorem is much more general than that. It doesn't concern only groups, but it extends to any stack over C. And uh, it says that the category of covariant functors from C to the topos of the fibers is equivalent to the classifying topos of the stack. In this case, nothing is seriously changed compared to group if the group is replaced by a groupoid. And if we consider category F, which is fibered in groupoids over the category C, or its associated stack. For our own purpose, uh, in fact, uh, we have also considered post sets and post sets fibered in groupoids instead of groupoids. It's something that uh, I think that Daniel will uh, introduce them, uh, but it will not be part of my uh, talk. So with groups, uh, we open uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 neural, the convolutional neural networks. With groupoid, uh, in fact, what is interesting is that we open, in fact, uh, the uh, interpretation of uh, the long short-term memory cell RNNs. So for example, or what are called, for example, the attention networks, which are very powerful networks. So, it's a generalization uh, which is very, very interesting for us. Then we have the language. So in fact, we have to consider uh, now a vibration, another vibration of F, which is denoted in this case A, and uh, uh, which uh, choose an adapted language and the semantics over every object of the architecture augmented by a context in, in it's in its uh, internal category F. So uh, in this case, the objects U of the architectural category C, uh, together with Xi uh, of uh, the fiber F on U, will represent uh, the pre-semantic context in the layer represented by U. And each one of them possesses a reservoir of logic in the classifying sets of parts omega of uh, uxi. And uh, in fact, uh, the transmission of the potential logics between layers and contexts uh, for uh, 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 morphism alpha h will go into the two directions. So uh, Daniel will, be, uh, will explain with more details uh, this, uh, these uh, logical functors. So pi stars, and so uh, covariant functor pi substar and the contravariant one pi uh, index, uh, uh, sorry, uh, exponent uh, star, which come respectively from the right agent, adjoint, sorry, uh, F star alpha and the left adjoint F uh, uh, alpha, so which extend uh, are the Yoneda extensions of the pullback uh, defined by the functor F alpha. So you will have a, a more detailed explanation by, uh, in the next uh, talk. So, and they will give rules of transformation of the formulas or axioms that will be available uh, at one layer into formulas of axiom to another layer, so to another, uh, to another connected layer. And uh, it can be a backward or forward uh, uh, depending on the pi star that we're considering. So pi star will be a uh, pi exponent star will be a kind of projection when pi sub star will be a section of pi exponent star. So it's uh, in fact one is uh, let's say uh, will uh, um, go to the, the 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 output theories when the other one in fact will enrich uh, by considering some other possibilities. So it's something uh, that. Uh, will be explained by uh, Daniel uh, later on. So now just uh, uh, before considering uh, the, this uh, concept of information, briefly uh, some, uh, I would like to show you the results of some uh, uh, basic experiments. And uh, I would like to thanks a lot uh, uh, Xavier Giraud for that. He performed all those uh, experiments. So the first one, 
uh, were done by using uh, small networks. And uh, in fact, uh, we want to do, we have been inspired by uh, uh, a result from uh, two neuroscientists. So, uh, Moshevakis and Neromioltis, uh, so two Greek uh, neuroscientists, which have, uh, uh, in fact, analyzed uh, what was happening um, after uh, the what are called the motor equivalent cells, so MEC neurons, uh, and uh, so it, and the, they found that the neurons that were coming afterwards were in fact uh, uh, performing, uh, let's say, Boolean uh, propositional calculus, and uh, we wanted. Uh, to see exactly what was happening if we replaced those neurons by using artificial neural networks. So we uh, modeled the uh, output of the MEC cells uh, by, uh, in fact, uh, using uh, some activation signal that, are, uh, that were distributed using a von Mises uh, uh, probability uh, distribution function. And the idea is that we have uh, an activator, A, that can take uh, three values, capital E, which is the I, that means it corresponds uh, to uh, uh, an activation of the, of the eye of the monkey, because those experiments uh, were done on uh, monkeys. It can be, so capital H was the hand, and EH was, in fact, both uh, I and end. okay? So, in fact, uh, the, uh, we used uh, very small neural networks. The first uh, experiment were with three layers. So an input layer L0, an output layer L2, and uh, just one hidden layer L1. And uh, those uh, uh, numbers are just the number of neurons per layer. And uh, then uh, we tried also four layers and five layers in order to see what was happening. The activation function was the hyperbolic tangent, okay? So just very quickly, here is what uh, is happening. So those circles, in fact, on those circles, you can see uh, 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 the activation of uh, one neuron. So in some hidden layer. So um, in fact, uh, this is cell one, cell two, cell three, and cell four. You can see that, for example, this is the way they are encoded, <clears throat> the blue, a uh, curve uh, represents, in fact, uh, the uh, response of the neuron uh, when it's uh, the eye, okay? The uh, uh, red one, uh, the response of the neuron with, when it is the hand, and the green one when it is both eye and hand, okay? So, well, and then when the, the, when the curve is dashed, it means that, in fact, uh, uh, the, the sign of the output of the hyperbolic tangent is minus one. And uh, if it is not dashed, it is plus one, okay? So as you can see here, when the curve is red, in fact, the response, the sign of the response depends on uh, the angle. But when it is blue or green, it doesn't depend on the angle. So we cannot, in fact, deduce any logical behavior when it is red, but we can deduce here a logical behavior when it is blue or green. If it is blue, so it's I, we can say that I implies minus one, it is the sign minus one. And when it is I and H, it implies also minus one. If we contrapose those two implications, then we obtain that one implies the hand. So that means that if we have, um, so, um, so if the output of, the, uh, uh, of this cell is uh, uh, positive, then it means that it was the hand that was at, which was the activation at the input, right? We can uh, see the same, for example, for cell four here. So we have only one curve that doesn't change sign. It is the blue one. So it means that I implies, in this case, plus one. And if we contrapose this implication, it means that minus one implies hand or 
EH. So you can see that here, this uh, neuron performs already uh, uh, proposition, Boolean propositional calculus, all right? With three hidden layers, then the network generates complete triplets of cell. That means that in, the, in this case, a triplet will be sufficient to conclude in any case, because the triplet here always, in fact, has this kind of behavior. So one implies I, one implies H, or one implies EH, minus one implies, etc. okay? So from these, uh, this behavior of the three cells of the triplet, in fact, we can conclude, uh, uh, we can conclude in any case because, uh, okay, when you have a, a configuration that implies the false, it means that in fact, uh, this configuration never happens basically. And uh, for the other configuration, we can always conclude it without any, uh, any, uh, any uh, ambiguity, all right? What is interesting here in this experiment is that we have used uh, two different encodings for EH or EH at the output. The first one where we encoded, in fact, uh, these three uh, activation activities, sorry, by uh, using just an interval, right? And uh, this was, uh, E was at one uh, end of the interval, EH at the other end and H at, in the middle, okay? And the problem is that in this case, it was very hard to make logical cells appear. But then by using uh, this, uh, 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 encoding, um, then, uh, of course, this encoding uh, uh, respect in some sense uh, the group of symmetries of the problem because uh, you basically you can exchange A, E, H, or E, H, right? And uh, in this case, in fact, of course, by using it, uh, so the, the, then the, the logical cells were appearing much, much more easily. So it is something that in fact shows uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, the action of this group is very important. In this case, it's the, the, the symmetry group. Okay, then also we have done some uh, experiments when uh, instead of considering three classes, we are considering more classes. So in this, and uh, we were considering what we call the logical information ratio, which was the number of decidable logical propositions at each layer um, divided by the number of uh, logical propositions that can be uh, 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 generated uh, by in, in the theory. And uh, in this case, you can see that when you go from the input layer to the output layer, then this uh, logical information ratio increases uh, and at the end basically you can uh, 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 you can decide uh, everything in the theory okay we have done also some experiment uh, based uh, on uh, predicate calculus uh, and uh, so in this case we have considered oh, very quickly <laughs> uh, uh, three uh, bars uh, uh, two or three bars it could be a red bar and grid bar or also a blue bar in our experiments. And we were considering uh, uh, an interval, so a line, uh, and, uh, or it could be also a circle. So we, we have tried also to consider line uh, uh, module or something. And uh, in fact, uh, for example, for two bars, the questions that were asked were, so the first one, D, are they disjoint or I, I, is one bar including the other one or why or can they intersect but the shortest is not included in the longest. So you can see that compared to the input layer where you just some sense scan a region uh, of uh, this uh, interval or of the circle, uh, in fact, uh, the propositions that are, in, that are involved, uh, in fact, are predicates and not just uh, coming from proposition calculus. So with three bars, the same questions, but of course with more possibilities. In fact, for example, so these are the first results. If we train with bars 
of respective lens five units and three units for R and G. And if we test with the same lengths, then, uh, in fact, let's use this uh, figure maybe uh, rather. So here, in fact, uh, a bar can be uh, just uh, uh, encoded by using the center of the bar and the, 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 the lengths of, of, of the bars. In this case, what we can see is that, uh, in fact, uh, the, the testing looks uh, almost perfect. I mean, it, because uh, uh, basically we are able to, I mean, it's uh, because the testing uh, is done with the same lengths. In fact, we don't ask to the neural network to generalize in any sense. But if we ask it to generalize, uh, then for example, by using uh, still for training uh, the bars of lengths five and three, and for testing, for example, with lengths four and six, and also we can exchange uh, the, the, the bars now, uh, for example, the, the longest one in training becomes the longest, the shortest one in testing. Then uh, as you can see, the results are not so bad, but uh, it's quite blurry here, here, here. And uh, here, so uh, it's, uh, I mean, uh, of course, it's not bad, but uh, uh, of course, uh, still uh, a little bit uh, worse than uh, in the preceding case. What is interesting also is that uh, uh, if we are considering, uh, uh, for example, less than three hidden layers, then the neural network is not using logics to perform uh, the, the, the task, but is, it's using Fourier analysis. But from three layers and beyond, then it's a logical analysis that is uh, performed, all right? Uh, what is interesting is that uh, 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 disconnection and uh, inclusion only are the most frequent outputs. And uh, in order to decide the inclusion only, uh, in fact, most neurons, instead of, of training to decide it directly, they eliminate the two other uh, possibilities, uh, D or II. Probably because IO is more difficult from the point of view of predicate calculus than the two other possibilities. But it's just an hypothesis. Okay, if uh, we have enriched training, uh, in this case, then, uh, um, in fact, uh, we have a remarkable logical behavior, yeah, where we just by using, uh, in fact, uh, 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 the, the outputs of two neurons, we can basically uh, answer to the, the, the questions that are um, asked. Of course, it's, uh, I mean, uh, it needs. Uh, um, uh, um, quite high generalization power from the neural network, but it's not bad at all. There is also a very nice relation between the weights uh, on the, uh, I mean, the, the lattice weights and the logic. In fact, what is interesting is that at the last layers, in fact, uh, weights, it is as if weights were performing the proof. Uh, sorry, because here we can see that um, for example, sorry, maybe it's, uh, yes, if you're considering, uh, 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 for example, uh, the histogram of deductive power of the weights applied to quantized activities, if you are considering all possible uh, triplets of uh, neurons at uh, this layer, uh, with, uh, in this case, it's uh, six objective functions, so it's uh, three colors, then you can see that the weights are, I mean, uh, um, I mean, are distributed um, basically in almost everywhere, let's say. But if you just select the uh, triplets that are, I mean, the interesting triplets, then the weights, in fact, become much more I mean, have a distribution that is uh, much more uh, 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 narrow. And uh, so it, it's, it's really because in this case, uh, they are, in fact, uh, they, they basically, in, in fact, they basically perform the, the, the proof from the, 
the, the for example, the, the last hidden layer to the output layer. Also, we had, uh, oh, oh, sorry, maybe I, I will have to skip it because I have uh, not uh, much time. Uh, uh, okay, so now let's go to the, to the part four, which is in fact uh, something related to uh, the notion of uh, semantic information. If we want to define what is uh, semantic information, then we need uh, to understand how uh, semantics uh, uh, appears, uh, for example, if you use a neural network. Okay. First of all, the semantic uh, uh, category that we will consider uh, uh, is, a, I mean, uh, is a quite general category. So first of all, uh, the artificial intelligence is connected uh, to the real world, the one that we are perceiving. And so in this case, languages have to be, let's say, as general as possible. Uh, they cannot be just uh, the languages that uh, are used currently, for example, in mathematics. They, they have to be uh, uh, richer than that. And uh, as uh, it has been suggested uh, in uh, Lambeck and Scott, in fact, a good caricature of semantics will be, of course, the interpretation of the language of in a concrete category. Of course, toposes are a good example, but here we aim at being more general. So, and what we propose is by closed monoidal category. And uh, in fact, uh, it is a category such that for any triple of objects, X, Y, and A, there will exist uh, two, uh, let's say exponent, exponential objects, one on the left and one on the right, and natural bijections such that those uh, equivalents will be uh, satisfied. So what does it mean in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, language? It means that if, for example, x, y, etc., are the meanings of, of something, so uh, the, 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 this uh, tensor product would be the composition and uh, the exponents on the the exponentials on the left and on the right will be respectively the conditioning of A by respectively the presupposition of X or the post supposition of Y. And uh, the rows in this category would be associations of uh, meaning, uh, evocations, etc. Of course, if uh, those two exponential, if they can commute, then uh, we uh, get uh, the, the, the classical case of, uh, of toposis. So, in this case, uh, theories will be collection of objects and rows such that if, uh, let's say, A is, uh, belongs to the theory T, and uh, if uh, this row from A to B is in A, then B has to be in A. And uh, two actions of this monoid A, so the one on the right and one on the left, given by the exponentials, will be named conditioning. And these conditionings will be essential to define the notion of semantic information that will be defined in, in more details by Daniel in the next talk. So let's, let's, say, let's see now uh, what, what we call data sets. In fact, we will see that it's not in machine learning, they are not really data sets that are much more than that. So in order to see that, let's consider the case of supervised learning. So we have input data, so xain, which are, let's say, uh, elements of uh, a big set of, of, uh, of possible data. So they are basically all possible data that can be seen at some point by the neural network, right? And then you have at the output, basically, uh, some theories T out belongings to uh, 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 a set of theory, uh, uh, capital uh, theta, all right? So in the classical uh, settings of machine learning, a neural network is seen as a parameterized set of functions. So FW, so it's parameterized by the, the, the weights W from uh, 
uh, and uh, which associate to any data, Xain, a theory, Tiaut. For example, you have data and you have to say if it is a cat is true or false. So for, for this a very simple example. So there have been in uh, universal, uh, universal approximation theorem by Saibenko in 1989 that says that uh, continuous maps from a compact subset K of a numerical set space, sorry, RD, so basically in this case, it would be the input data, to another numerical space can be approached uniformly on any compact subsets by a standard neuronal map with fixed nonlinearity of sigmoidal types. So the sigmoids are, uh, uh, it's an example of activation function, okay? So basically this shows that the neural network works well for interpolation, right? But the problem is that it has to be a compact subset. So now what happens outside the compact subset? Because the problem is that in theory, even with a low probability, you can, in fact, some new, completely new thing input can happen. And in this case, you have absolutely no guarantee that you will find the right theory corresponding to these data. Okay, so what about extrapolation? In fact, it is related to what is called generalization uh, in machine learning, which is the possibility for a neural network to be able to extrapolate. Let's say, but in order to do that, just a, a, a theorem of analysis is not enough at all. We need something else. We need to capture the essence so the structures of the data with respect to the goal, which is in fact related to the task or the question which is asked to the network. And in this case, what we want is that a small set of data, of data, sorry, size zero, which will be the, 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 the set of data used for training the network can be considered as representative for the learning problem. That means that just training of this data set is sufficient to know basically what will happen over the whole po possible data sets, XA, right? And uh, in this case, the approach of deep learning is in fact what I presented you, to you in, the, in uh, the, the second part, which is to construct an architecture that will be expressed using the Grothendieck site of the, the, the uh, of the architecture of the neural network, a stack which will be uh, considered by using vibrations in groups, groupoids, or modular categories, and the langu language, sorry, which will be a vibration over the stack of layers of neurons, which will be able to extract the structure from a minimal sampling size zero. And in fact, uh, we will have the relations between data and theories through now properties. So that we mean invariance by the action of a group or something more general, groupoids or modular categories. Okay. So this is in fact, uh, uh, we, we just introduce the action of, uh, in fact, something much more general than the action uh, of a group on a set or of a groupoid on a set, uh, which is in fact the action of a category G on another category uh, V. So the, this category G will act on this other category V when in fact the contravariant functor from G to V is given. And in this case, because for example, if a group acts on a set, we need to consider elements. So we need to define elements in the category V, so which will be just a, a, a phi, which will be a morphism from U to V, which will be considered as an element of the object V. So now the definition of, of the action, uh, suppose that, we, that G, so the first category acts, so this functor F from G to V, and we have V equals F of A, so, then, in fact, the orbit of phi under the slice category G over A will be the functor from this left slice category to the right slice category. And uh, it will associate to any morphism this element of F of A prime in V and to any arrow 
from A second to A prime over A, this corresponding morphism from U uh, to F of prime to U to F of uh, A second. And so in this case, the theory of topos, stacks, and languages will extend the notion of actions of categories and their morphism to the action of fibered category F to fibered category B. And uh, in fact, from group equivalence, which in fact uh, is represented uh, uh, in uh, the structural properties of CNNs, for example, will go to categorical equivalence. Okay. And uh, so, in particular, so what we have is that now, given a shift of category from C to CAT, for example, a stack on group A or in some other categories that we consider as a structure of invariance, and another shift that we consider as a structure of information flow, for example, possible theories or information spaces that Daniel will define afterwards. Given an object Q of C, an action F on M will be a family of contravariant functors such that we have this uh, nice commutation relation. This is a vast generalization of group equivalence, and it will allow us to consider much, much more general structure, structures, sorry, on uh, neural networks in order to take into account so many, many aspects, structural aspects, and the fact that we we will be able to generalize much more, much better than what is currently done. So, okay, uh, sorry, it's, it's a little bit late, but um, um, okay, we have done an hypothesis of invariance enlargement. That means that in this, between the inputs psi and uh, in fact, in the output, there exists a kind of uh, layer which we call uh, uh, a maximal invariance layer uh, that contains basically uh, the, the, the full possibility of, uh, of invariance of the problem, all right? So, okay. And in this case, uh, Okay, I, I, I'm sorry because it's a little bit uh, late. I have to be very, very, very quick. So the correspondence from the input side to the output of theories of theta will be said to be justified if there is a language which is external or coming from some supervisor wider than the language of the output, so the language of the question, but coarser and broader than the language of the input, basically, which is... Uh, just a very simple theory is what, where you have just many, many objects, for example, the pixels of the image, by, but basically uh, no uh, morphisms, and uh, which are the languages respectively adapted to the questions at the output and the encoding of the input. And this correspondence will factorize by the language LX through a collection of expressions of this type, the following aspects, A, B, C, of Xi in the language of input, expressed by sentences in the language of X, uh, of X, in the language LX, sorry, will characterize the proposition in the language of output. Okay? Okay, yeah. And so in this case, we consider something in order to be able then to propose a kind of a theorem of semantic coding, which is this zigzag category, so where you have uh, two semantic, uh, uh, um, sorry, where you have, sorry, fibered categories at the input, at the output, two semantic sheaves of language, respectively at the input and output given by uh, the fibered category. And now we will assume that on F, this uh, central category, which in fact, uh, Will be uh, the, the, the will be uh, um, uh, the place where you will have uh, the maximum invariance. Um, we'll, we will have this language uh, A, and that can provide uh, the justification from for the mapping sigma from the input to the output, right? 
And uh, then to prove that every justified problem can be, re oops, sorry, realized, uh, oops, uh, by triple C, F, and A, we must realize this F and A by a stack in languages over a site C that is given by a neural network architecture. Okay, and the invariance under F will be isomorphic to the maximal enlargement of the stack. So this is for now uh, just a, 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 an hypothesis, I mean, a, a kind of a conjecture that uh, we hope to be true. Okay. Um, okay, this is uh, just the first notion of semantic information that has been introduced by Carnap and Barilel in 1952. In, the, in this case, what they had was, uh, in fact, uh, elementary propositions. In this, case, in this example, for example, they had uh, three subjects, A, B, C, and then these subjects were individuals, were persons, that could be either, that have two different attributes, M for male, F for female, Y for young and O for old, all right? And then uh, elementary propositions were just something in which you say that A is young and male or, and B is young and female and C is old and male, for example, all right? And then the combinatorics, in this case, of course, is the or of all these elements of all possible uh, parts of uh, those uh, propositions, elementary propositions, all right? But what is interesting is that in this case, what could be information? In fact, by considering uh, some shapes uh, in uh, sh some spaces and shapes, I, I will show in which way. For example, we can see that there exists a Galois group G of the language that is generated by the permutation of the n subjects, in this case three, the permutations of the values of each attribute and the permutation of the attributes that have the same number of possible values. In this case, the group of subjects permutation is, is uh, the, 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 the symmetric group uh, uh, S3. The transposition of values will be sigma A uh, A1, A2, uh, I mean, uh, this uh, transposition, uh, and for same for the gender uh, transposition. And then you have four exchanges of attributes defined by this uh, uh, permutation, by this permutation, sigma, k, and k3, and tau, right? And uh, this group is generated by, the group generated by sigma, sigma A and sigma J, in fact, will be of order eight. It is simply the dihedral group, D4, of all the isometries of the square with these vertices. And the stabilizer of a vertex will be the cyclic groups C2 of type either sigma or tau. And the stabilizer of an edge will be of type sigma A or sigma G, and it will be denoted this way. So in this case, the Galois group of the language will be G, which is uh, the, the product of, uh, uh, of S3 and D4. That means that in the language here, L will be a sheaf over the category G, which plays the role of the fiber F and C as only one object U0 in this case, okay? So you have four types of orbits. And what is interesting is that in fact, all those types in fact can generate a new proposition in the, this big language. For example, for type one, uh, can be translated into all the subjects of the same attributes. And this is why, etc. for the other types, this is why we need to consider now information measures, semantic information measures that are not only uh, scalar quantities as it is the case in uh, Shannon information measures, but these, those need to have value in, uh, 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 in a space. Right, which is in this case, uh, in fact, uh, okay. Uh, uh, so maybe I have to stop, sorry. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Jean-Claude.